I don't know if my mic is on, but my I used to live next to a main road, so I project myself well, so you will hear me. So I want to start by just uh, thanking uh, the people who have traveled quite a lot of distances to be here from Pakistan, from Kenya, from Germany, uh, from Holland, and from uh, uh, you know Luxembourg. So thank you very much for the folks that have made the effort to come here. I also want to thank uh, MetLife for providing us with such nice facilities. And as you know, this would be taped, and ultimately we would have some videos available. Uh, I want to thank Sandra and Bruce and Columbia and Matan especially, who's really been the backbone of this conference, and uh, Michael and Aaron from my team, who've been really also working closely with putting this together. Um, so, and thanks are really uh, due to all the speakers who have made time uh, and to prepare and to try to do things in a different way. Uh, and the idea and the objective of this conference is really, you know, to sort of showcase to institutional investors um, and not necessarily uh, limited to them, but to potential people interested in impact investing as to what has already been achieved and uh, because there's a whole lot of investors, and not, not a lot of investors, but there's a whole lot of investors who have invested in impact investing for the past 20 years. You know, the likes of some of them you would hear from CPG and MetLife and others that are not here, like Prudential and AXA and others that have been investing for 20 years into the impact investing sector, which was not even called impact investing at that that time. So my thanks goes out to all of them and to you for joining us. And I think uh, I would like to sort of uh, have a hand, uh, give applause to all of uh, the participants in the meeting. So please join me. So the meeting today really is about participation and an interactive discussion. We tried to do the utmost we could to facilitate uh, a sense of that your voice and comments are relevant here, that you don't just have to listen, that you can participate, and we encourage that. Uh, there are a couple of rules around that participation. One is that your comments or questions have been to the relevant issue at hand. Uh, you know, so we are talking about the North, and you can't say, hey, South is part of the North, and let's talk about the South. So that is not allowed. It has to be focused on it. And maybe uh, from time to time, we might ask you to sort of delay your question when a uh, you know, different uh, topic at hand is being discussed. And I apologize if it seems curt or we are sort of trying to cut you off, but the intention is not to do that. Really, the intention is uh, to focus on the issue at hand and to discuss that. There are other elements to this that I want to mention briefly is that, uh, you know, with Columbia, we will sort of create a booklet uh, around impact investing, which would be much broader than people represented here. And the idea is that ultimately, uh, we will uh, you know, send that out to institutional investors. As I've been in this sector for, you know, I used to say I was the oldest fund manager in impact investing. I stopped saying that since I've become old. I say I'm the longest serving. Uh, <laughs> Uh, asset manager in this sector, and I've really seen a lot of growth. And with age, what comes is perspective, you know, because as a young person, you don't see what you're, what you're doing and the impact of what you're doing can be. Uh, and I have seen, for example, uh, in microfinance, the first fund at Deutsche Bank that we were engaged in, and um, Michael uh, and I was partnering with me then, the whole focus of the Deutsche Bank Microcredit Development Fund was to bring banks to microfinance. It was a fund that guaranteed banks to come to microfinance. At that stage, about 20 years ago, there was not a single you know, bank in developing country. I, I might be exaggerating, but they were yeah, uh, probably right. Not a single bank that was engaged in microfinance. And now there is not a single bank that is not engaged in microfinance. And that is only within the span of 20 years, right? So I want to ask you guys, um, do you think that impact uh, investment is a great asset investment for institutional investors? 
Now, if you don't participate, I'm going to call names because I know some of you. So, so I think it's important for, to participate. Tell us, what's your, what's your thought? What have you seen? Because there's a lot of people here uh, that bring you know, a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge and experience in impact investing. So do you think that impact investing is a realistic asset class for institutional investors as we talk about it today? Two yeses, and very timid yeses. We got to have a little bit more energy in the room. So who else? Do you think that impact investment is ready for institutional investors? It depends on how it's defined. Okay, that's a very good comment. I think, yeah. Yeah. Right. Those are very good, and that's why I say that you know you have a lot to offer and both those comments are really uh, insightful comments in terms of the definition is clearly important you know uh, because it's uh, it's uh, it's important uh, discussion element as to what is impact investing uh, i used to say that if you make a bar on the corner of the street that's impact investing you know because People come here, they have a good time, they meet, they have kids, they prolong civilization. Hey, what, what's the bigger impact than that? So any investment has an impact. So you know how you sort of define impact investing is, is important. Um, but in, you know, for institutional investors, as uh, Cyril was saying, the definition and how institutional investors see it is also a challenging uh, task because you know all of these institutional investors some of uh, you are representing within these larger organization there are a series of hurdles that you have to pass through it's not that easy uh, you know to go through the gatekeepers and the advisors and it's a catch-22 sort of element so today is a start of a discussion it, at the first part we are going to have some of the leading minds uh, you know talk about what they have done in the afternoon, we will talk about what are some of the fields that are there. And at the end, we will try to sort of come up with some working groups that will continue the conference fever and take it to the next side. And the book booklet complements that idea because, you know, going, getting impact investors to, um, go, getting institutional investors to impact investing is not an easy task, but I remind you, of what statements I made about microfinance and banking. And in the longer term, there is no other way except that the institutional investors would come into impact investing and these assets, these opportunities would further. And I look forward to your active participation and discussion. And like I said, if you don't actively participate, I have the list of attendees and I'll call on people. But with that, I think, uh, Bruce, it's yours. Thank you, Assad. All right, good morning, everyone. Let's just see if this is working. There we go. All right, so um, <clears throat> I'm Bruce Usher, and I worked in the finance sector for many years and uh, was CEO of a social enterprise for a number of years. And I'm now a faculty member at Columbia Business School, where I focus on social enterprise and impact investing specifically. And I feel really comfortable in this room because just like my classroom, no one sits in the front row. Right? They're all. <laughs> You know, I'll uh, try to stay away. Um, I do hope people warm up and come up towards the front. Um, what I want to do in the next 20 minutes or so, talk about the history of impact investing, the future of impact investing, and the challenges going forward. When I say the history, I'm not going to give you the history. Everyone in this room knows the history of impact investing. What I want to touch on is a couple of macro trends that allowed for this to happen in the last 20 years, as, as Asad mentioned. <clears throat> this didn't happen earlier, it didn't happen later, it happened now for certain reasons. There are some bigger macro trends going on, societal trends that are now pushing us forward at a great pace going to the future, and there are some challenges ahead. So let me, let's first talk about the, the history here, confluence of financial trends. The first is this mysterious category of human beings, these millennials, which a few of you are in the room. 
Unfortunately, a sad night on qualify for millennials. Um, but in all seriousness, as you know, there's this transfer of wealth going on, an ex extraordinary transfer of wealth, never before happened in human history. So much capital moving from an older generation to a younger generation. And why that matters to us here in the room is that millennials exhibit a far greater interest in sustainability. And anecdotally speaking, having been in academia and teaching now for 20 years, we see that. We see dramatically growing interest in sustainability more broadly, in impact investing more narrowly, not in a small number of students, but actually across the university. The second macro trend that's happened that's affected the sector is female investors. Um, until a few decades ago, uh, women participating in the financial services sector, women directing money, women making investment decisions was relatively rare. In fact, events like this was not, when I was in financial services was mostly men. That has changed and that has changed for the better in the sense that female investors exhibit more interest in sustainability than male investors, again, driving the trend. And third and perhaps most importantly, the financial sector investors have found that there are investing opportunities related to sustainability. Whether we look at uh, clean energy, education, ag, food, uh, water, housing, name your sector, there are um, interesting opportunities to invest here. And this is actually a very important point. Again, 20 years ago, as Asad mentioned, the idea you can invest in a sector that was con considered impactful, say microfinance, and earn a return. This was a fairly ludicrous idea at the time, and that's why only one bank was willing to do it initially. Now that's well accepted. Uh, as a result, unsurprising, what we now see is financial institutions moving to the sector, building capacity, whether it's MetLife or Morgan Stanley or just pick any incumbent financial firm today, and they have activity in impact investing. I think what I'm telling you is I think some things you, everyone in this room probably already knows. Let's talk about the future, because that's where it gets more interesting. Oh, I just want to touch on the fact, obviously, we've seen tremendous growth in assets. Again, no surprise there. The one thing I will say here is actually there's a great amount of uncertainty around how big the sector is, how fast it's grown, and how many players there are. A lot of the information is self-reported, and there is no good agreement around definitions, which was mentioned here just a few minutes ago. All right, let's talk about the future then. So there are four large social trends going on. I want to actually spend a minute on each one that are likely to strongly influence the direction of this sector and, and provide additional momentum. Consumers are willing to pay more. Employees are willing to work for less. Trust is eroding. And we have a mainstream of social impact going on. Let me touch on the first of these. Consumers are willing to pay more. Um, Nielsen, which, which tracks these sort of things, uh, does their surveys. And in their surveys, they're finding, again, that generally speaking, younger people, again, this mythical millennial, will in fact pay more for products and services that they believe to be sustainable or, shall we say, impactful. And we actually see this anecdotally. You can walk into any coffee shop in the country, and they're always pushing how impactful and sustainable their coffee is. They do that because consumers want that. That's what they want to pay for. Employees are willing to work for less. My colleague at Columbia Business School, uh, Vanessa Burbano, she did a study a couple of years ago. It was actually a very clever study um, using online job marketplaces. She basically put jobs out there. They were fake jobs. <laughs> um, but she described them differently, where the job had impact or did not. And what she found through a study, she did in two labor markets. I think one was TaskRabbit. I can't remember the other one. Um, <clears throat> she found that statistically speaking, and it was, it was quite, uh, quite well defined, that employees, workers, were willing to work for less if they thought their work was going to have social impact, if they thought that the employer was socially responsible. And anecdotally, again, we see this at Columbia. We see our students. They don't want to work for less, by the way. So when they come to work for you, please pay them really well. Um, but in fact, there is a willingness, if not to work for less, there's a, a strong desire to work for companies that are viewed as socially responsible. And in the job market of today, where in fact companies compete 
for labor. There is a shortage of labor, especially for highly, highly educated people. For companies to be more socially responsible is a competitive advantage in terms of attracting talent. The third trend, <clears throat> trust in government. This is actually a really disappointing trend, I think, but it's, it is what it is. Um, businesses now rank higher in trustworthiness than government. Here in the US in particular, government is sometimes viewed as not the solution to our social problems, but the problem itself. Um, when I teach uh, at Columbia Business School, I always have a number of European students in the class. Columbia Business School is about 50% international. And inevitably, somewhere during the course, we'll talk about using impact investing or some business tool to solve a social problem. And a European student will put up their hand and go, I don't understand. Isn't the government responsible for solving this problem? And I sigh and say, welcome to America. Because the fact is, we, are, we don't trust government to solve these problems, but um, it's just where we're at. And the last macro trend is just the wide-scale mainstreaming of social impact. Building on the comment that Saad made, not only are banks now moving into impact investing, but more broadly, there is a discussion across the business community about the role of business and the social impact of companies. And again, this won't surprise you. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Larry Fink's letter from BlackRock. Society is demanding companies to have a social purpose. And then this past summer, the business roundtable. In the business community and the academic business community, this is a very big deal. Since 1970, we've generally supported Milton Friedman's idea that the social purpose of business is to make profit. And we designed our teaching and our courses and our students and our, um, <clears throat> our optimizing of business around shareholder ma value maximization. That's the way it's been done. Well, this is a big change. And the implications for that are very unclear. And frankly, there's an enormous amount of controversy about how real this is, what's going to change, what won't change, and what expectations are. But the fact is, we are at some sort of turning point or inflection point in the role of business more broadly. So these four macro trends are relevant to our work to impact investing because that's what's pushing us forward. It's not good intentions, though good intentions matter. It's these winds at our back that are going to make a big difference to this sector in the future, I believe. That's the good news. <laughs> um, like any good news, there are winds at our back, but there are storm clouds ahead, to, to use a metaphor. Um, and I want to put those out there, because this is what I think is worthy of, of, of discussion. Um, and I really would appreciate some feedback and, and uh, discussion around them. Challenges. Uh, the first has already been alluded to. We have a real problem around agreeing on what is impact investing. What are the definitions here? What is the sector? Is ESG impact investing? I think many people in this room would say no. But there are many impact investors, uh, there are many ESG investors who use the term impact investing. And so on. I just use that as a very simplistic example. This, this is a problem. If we don't have agreement on sector definitions, we will uh, dilute the message. Um, everyone in this room is familiar with this, though. The challenge around impact measurement and management. It's impact investing. We know how to measure and manage the investing piece. We are really challenged to measure and manage the impact piece. And I think one of the uh, areas we trip over here is the attribution of impact. Everyone's going around saying, I'm the investor. I made this happen. And then others are saying, no, you didn't make it happen. It was going to happen. Otherwise, is it additional? A lot of complexity around this issue. Curiously, on the investing side, no one no one asked that question. Just because you invested in a company and the company goes on to become the next Google or whatever you want to pick and makes its investors a ton of money, no one goes around and saying, well, your investment did or did not make the difference to that company's success. We don't get hung up on that. But in the impact investing world, we do. And this, again, is an issue that we simply need to 
come together on and, and figure out what is acceptable and what is not. The third challenge, of course, is maintaining impact upon exit. If we impact investors and there's only impact while we're in the room, that's a problem. And we don't have a lot of experience here because we haven't had a lot of exits yet. The sector is at most 20 years old, but really most of the investing has been in the last half dozen years or so. Not a lot of exits, not a lot of experience maintaining impact upon exits. So that's an upcoming challenge. <clears throat> this obviously is a challenge. Anytime a sector becomes pretty exciting, pretty hot, everybody piles in, we have this risk of impact washing and reputation risk to the sector. It's not just the activity of those who are in the room, but it's the activity of anybody who, uh, <clears throat> who uh, s states that they're part of the sector. Uh, there is impact washing going on today, and there always will be. It's a natural part of a rapidly growing sector, but that creates a reputation risk for the entire sector. And lastly, expectations are very high. I haven't seen anything this high uh, in the financial sector in, in, in a decade or more. A lot of capital move, is moving in, a lot of uh, expectations about may, what may be accomplished. And here's the problem with the expectations. Investing is really hard to do successfully. For any one of you who've been in the financial services industry, <clears throat> generating an attractive risk-adjusted return is hard. In fact, by definition, half of all investors will underperform the market every year. Right? So that's hard. Social change, solving our social environmental problems, for those of you who have worked on that in the past, is also really hard. Try changing the world, not so easy to do. Doing the two together, it's an attractive proposition, but it's not easy. And I think we've raised expectations very high on what's possible here. So that's, that's the overview. I just wanted to give, sort of set the stage a bit. Um, we'd really enjoy getting some feedback on the, particularly the challenges, some uh, other challenges, disagreement, as you wish. Open it up. Sir. Yeah. Michael. Bruce, thank you very much for the overview. I think it's uh, very insightful. So just to follow up on one of the challenges um, that you mentioned having to do with um, with uh, measuring and managing impact. So the Nobel, P the Nobel uh, Prize winners uh, this year are um, energy Powell. and, yeah. yeah. Um, and they specifically do work in impact with randomized control trials and, yeah. and similar methods. Do you have any views on that to help sort of <clears throat> bring more empirical data to help moderate or mitigate some of the high uh, expectations so that we can kind of begin to shift from a more uh, um, aspirational base that we're on now to a more empirical base. And more empirical and more rigorous base, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, I think it's fabulous they won the Nobel uh, Prize because it, it really speaks to how important this kind of work is, right? Um, <clears throat> that being said, there's a reason why most organizations don't do RCTs, randomized control trials, because they're tremendously expensive. They take a long time. And in fact, they're really only valuable if they're longitudinal, so over many, many years. And in sectors that we've been doing this for a long time, like microfinance, I think this is very important and useful work. I think in a lot of the newer sectors, the newer financial tools that are being used today, I don't know how many people really have the resources to do that kind of work. And more importantly, it's probably going to be five or ten years before we know those results. So I look at the work at J-PAL and the RCTs as sort of one, one uh, the best. This is the gold standard. And I think the Nobel elevates that. But it's not realistic for everybody to be doing that. It's just not feasible. Uh, the, yeah. I mean, a lot of the... A, a, a lot of the impact that's going to be derived from these things is behavioral change. And behavioral change is generational. Yeah. So we're going to measure inputs. And yeah. so we're just going to measure our investment. So yeah. it doesn't really necessarily yeah. add to it. And there's two key points you make there. One is just there's a very long you know, generational change. You're sure you mentioned inputs. You're sort of alluding to what we call the logic, the logic table and the number of steps that you can measure in impact measurement. So that's one challenge of it. And the other challenge is who should be doing the measuring? 
Should it be the investors? Should it should be the social enterprise, whoever you're investing in? I don't think it should be either. I don't think either really has a responsibility or the resources to do that. We don't ask investors to measure the financial impact of the companies they invest in. The companies report those. I actually think in most cases it's going to be a third group, which is academia and nonprofits, which again comes back to the Nobel winners are affiliated with MIT. j is, is an affiliate uh, uh, part of MIT. That's where the expertise and the resources lie to do that kind of work. Um, there was a yeah, I, ju I just wanted to add a, a comment on measurement because on the one hand, I think it's great. And you know what Esther Duflo has been doing over the years is, is, is useful. But I'm also get, getting very concerned that there might be a trend developing that if you cannot measure it with confidence, it's irrelevant. Yeah. And I, I think this is wrong because not everything can be measured. And even what they are trying to do with this randomized thing, it's always questionable, yeah. you know? Uh, I mean, it's been done a long time ago about microfinance, but there are so many other factors when you have a community, you know, look at a community that play in. So um, my view, let, let, let me give you that example. If you say um, one of the rules should be do not do gender discrimination, you know, should we stop not avoiding gender discrimination if we cannot measure the impact of it? <coughs> yeah. You know, I think there's also a pact to, you know, do things right and do th things in a smart way. And I think when I said about uh, financial institutions, often what they're lacking is the understanding that um, taking impact or doing things right will lower their financial risk. Right. And this is something which is only being you now somewhat understood. Yeah. Let, me, let me address those two points separately. Because uh, first of all, I think impact measurement management is a challenge. I'm not suggesting that we need to necessarily do more impact measurement. I think we simply need to agree on what is effective impact measurement and where it's not effective and not necessary. I mean, one of my favorite expressions is lies, damn lies, and statistics. And it's, it really holds. Just because you come up with a measurement, in many cases, it doesn't actually tell you much. And in fact, can be t terribly misleading, right? That being said, there's just enormous confusion around it. And the more, by the way, when I teach impact investing, I, I, the, 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 the part of the lectures I really do not enjoy teaching are the impact measurement piece because there's just so much uncertainty around it. And um, I don't think we have any good answers there. Um, sir. Your comment about attribution um, and how nobody considers or cares about attribution on the investment return side mm -hmm. sort of implies that maybe a similar approach might be most useful on measuring and attributing who's responsible for the impact. And I'm curious to just hear more thoughts on that and also just say that in in the climate and specifically clean energy investment space, that's something that comes up constantly yeah. because, uh, you know, if a, if a government provides a subsidy to a project, <coughs> they're, it's very, very critical that they measure that the attribution of that, but yeah. then there's going to be three other co -pri private co-investors in that project and they all claim it and there's like triple counting of emissions and, you know, very often people say, well, who cares? It happens. So I'm yeah. curious to hear more about that. So in the interest of full disclosure, I'm, I'm somewhat biased on this point. And I'm biased on this point because my introduction to this field was <clears throat> in uh, climate change mitigation and clean energy investing. And so I have a lot of experience with <clears throat> uh, projects that earn carbon credits or renewable energy certificates and the like and spent many years dealing with the issue of what they call additionality. Additionality is how they measure uh, whether or not a project should receive uh, certain benefits, certain financial returns. In other words, you only get those that policy support if it would not have been built without the policy support. And my takeaway from uh, a number of years of working on this is that it's an enormous mistake to focus on it too much. And the reason is, um, it's, it's in, in theory, it makes a lot of sense. We want to channel capital to things that we're not getting capital and make sure that our investments are creating action that was not going to happen without us. Because it's going to happen anyway. Why bother? Why spend our morning here together? It's going to happen. Well, in theory, that's a, that's a beautiful concept. And in fact, there are all sorts of academic papers explaining why that makes sense. But in the real world, it's terribly messy. And the minute you try to differentiate and say, this capital is additional and this capital is not, it just doesn't work. And so what happens is it all freezes up. And people spend a lot of time and money arguing over who should get support and who should not. 
my, um, my perspective on this, and again, I'm slightly biased, um, and I'll throw out another one of my favorite expressions, is that perfect is the enemy of the good. Forget additionality. Don't worry about it. Just get more capital flowing in the right direction. Some of that capital will benefit perhaps where it didn't need that benefit. That's part of the cost of getting capital to move. And it all goes in the right direction. But again, I'm somewhat biased on that perspective, and I'm first to admit that. We actually have Mike here. Let me go here first and then over to you. All right, thank you. Yeah, some of the friction that I've heard in the marketplace from institutional investors is around the idea that there might be a conflict of interest investing in impact that doesn't immediately benefit their stakeholders or their uh, who they have the fiduciary responsibility sure. for. There have actually been some cases where institu large institutions have liked the merits of the investment strategy but reconsidered whether to allocate because of the potential reaction from their constituents. So I would be curious of your feedback and perhaps even others in the room if they have thoughts on how to address that. Yeah, and I think others in the room probably have some very good thoughts here. Let me just throw out two, two quick ones. One is, one is the legal issue, the fiduciary responsibility and the, and the legal requirements one requires fiduciary. I'm not gonna address that. That's, that's, first of all, I think we're now in pretty good shape on that, and others would, would, may have more to comment on the legal side. On the practical side, uh, um, my belief is that impact investing is successful when there is a clear alignment between, among the stakeholders. And those stakeholders include, of course, the providers of the capital, who may be LPs or, or pensioners or whoever is providing the capital, the managers of the capital, and the investee organizations. When there's an alignment, in other words, we're trying to maximize risk-adjusted returns. Let's, if that's where they are, let's start from there. What kind of investments can do that that also have impact uh, potential? In clean energy, for example, that's actually relatively easy. In other areas, let's say changing, addressing poverty, sometimes that can be much harder. We should only be doing it where there is clarity of alignment. When you have that, this issue goes away. When, when we have missed the line objectives, you run into trouble pretty quickly. I, I'm with CEI Ventures. Um, we're planning our fifth um, impact fund, and I've been doing market research, and I've been talking to investors and prospective investors and wealth managers in particular, particularly and peers, and I've been uh, calling out particularly to the wealth managers, say, you know, it might be new, they're representing other money, um, so maybe they're sort of the most, they have nothing, you know, no, no skin in the game per se. And I say, okay, we've got, we've got social impact of a variety and of a variety of things, jobs for people with low incomes, good jobs, environmental benefit, et cetera. What are you interested in? We ask these kinds of things. But we also ask about financial return. We've got, you know, profits and that sort of thing and increasing profits. Um, how do you feel about financial return? Do you need market return? Do you need, are you willing to give up anything? And we just, we just ask those questions. And some people say, and incidentally, the investees, the people running funds, some people say, absolutely not. We can get both. It's totally consistent, no problem whatsoever. You know, let's do it. Um, and then others say, no, absolutely. We're willing to give up something for all the good things that happen in these funds. I was wondering if you have a perspective on this. Well, my perspective is actually comes back to bullet point five, which is I think the expectations are too high in many cases. I think there are a lot of people who think, you can make a lot of money and save the world, change the world in a good way. It's great. I mean, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to do that? And I think there are cases where you can. Again, the area that I focus on primarily is climate change and particularly uh, clean energy. And in fact, there, there is potential to do quite well financially. But I think in many of these challenges, these social challenges we're, we're trying to address, um, no. No, you're not going to find market risk adjusted returns easily. And that's the key when I say risk adjusted returns, because some of these investments can do quite well, but you're taking on tremendous risk in many cases. And by the way, that's a good thing. If you're not taking on risk, you're probably not trying new things. You're probably not moving the needle on impact. You're probably not, actually, we're not addressing anything. Um, but the lack of clarity on this, the, the misguided expectations or assumptions, that, that is a problem. So I completely agree. I think clarity on this is, is absolutely necessary. I think we have one minute left. Is that correct, Asad? Let's stay on schedule.
Uh, uh, just keep going. Okay. Um, first, Neil, uh, because I tend to speak. I mean, uh, as someone invited me, say I told him I don't have time to prepare a presentation. Say so you don't have to, but you can speak as much as you want. <laughs> uh, and and uh, for context, as and I go back to microfinance days, and uh, now I'm doing. Re I've been doing renewable in emerging markets for uh, some t 12 years. Yeah. And I, uh, I tend to 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 disagree with some of the, the remarks you just made. Firstly, in terms of impact, there is what can be addressed with market mechanism and what cannot be addressed with market mechanism. The border is not always clear, it's sometimes quite clear. You know, renewable or microfinance can totally be addressed with market mechanism, and the issue of return is a hoax. I mean, it's fake news, you know. There is, there is a return if you do it well, if you do it correctly. It seems that when there is a financial crisis in the developing country, we find that to be normal, and when there, is, there are issues, financial return issues in, in, in poor countries, we think, ah, oh, here we go again, you know. So I think there is, it's a, there is a mental bias. Now the question is, you know, there is there is no market return that is universal. It's, it's you, one has to understand the underlying risk of what, what you know of the, what the investment is, and 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 this is what, how you invest and who is who is your manage your manager who is the underlying institutions. Some microfinance you know, institutions have done great financially and impact wise. Other have been a total catastrophe. Mm. But the thing is, because often one was well managed, the other one was not. You know, what's new? Um, so the um, I forgot why I disagree with you, but <laughs> 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 to the point. Well, actually, let me ask for a clarification because this is very interesting. You mentioned it's a hoax. What do you mean by that? I'm, I'm, I'm very I, curious. I've heard so often uh, raising money. Yeah. Know, uh, uh, most of the money I invest in the renewable in Uganda, in Poland, yeah. typically comes from private investors. Yeah. I've heard so often, you know, uh, why we need market return. I always say, what is market return? <laughs> there, is yeah. not a, I mean, there is not a number you read in Wall Street Journal every day. Today, market return is X. Yeah. And that's why when I say risk-adjusted market return, that's a shorthand for saying I, I, exactly what you're saying. Depending on where you are, when in time, and what kind of investment you're making, of course, you're, you're looking at different, different objectives, different targets. So I wanted to get back to that issue of fiduciary responsibility. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting is, because um, I hear it a lot in my practice, and so I w f find interesting two things. First of all, the bifurcation of you know, the things that you need to focus on from a financial perspective versus what might be considered externalities. And I really think we shouldn't be separating them, that the externalities are becoming more and more important to financial performance. Yeah. That's number one. So I think that's really important. And, um, yeah, what was the second thing? Um, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your, your point about externalities, I mean, really is, is this. In other words, does business have either a role or a and or a responsibility to consider externalities, consider stakeholders, consider societal issues? And by the way, these statements, you know, we all got excited because these statements came out, but they are tremendously controversial mm -hmm. at the moment. And not just the statement itself, but in fact, what does that mean for business? So I think so many people would agree with you that we should be considering all these. What there's disagreement on is now what? What does it actually mean for companies to consider externalities? What does it mean for investors to consider it? So the second issue, which I now remember, is, uh, <laughs> is basically the issue of performance. Mm. So, I mean, we have a lot of expectations for performance and impact investments, but you know what? We make perf um, investments every day in the mainstream markets that don't work out the way we had expected. That, you know, so why do we have a different framework or expect set of expectations for mainstream investments versus impact investments? Sure. So there's that as well. And I think those two things are really holding back um, institutions getting into this market. Okay. Yeah, please. And then we'll take one more question, and I think we should move on. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll repeat myself. Uh, you know, as a successful businessman, entrepreneur, and a professor, I'd like you to give your views of how you see the future. You know, it's, it's sort of a dream, mm -hmm. what you see happening in the next 10, 20 years in imp uh, impact investing. And then I want to make a statement that, you know, impact investing is not one thing. That they are like a like a you know population. They are young children, infants, toddlers, and adults. And you have to treat all of them 
differently. You know, you can't expect a child to grow faster by feeding them shish kebab. You know, it ha they have to be appropriately addressed. So there are markets where you can make more money than you can in the commercial market. Because whenever there is prejudice, there is opportunity. Pakistan, for example, horrible reputation. Amazing opportunities to make a lot of money in housing because there's so much need and they can, there is affordability there. It's just that the mental models are not there to change. And my, one of my favorite uh, gurus of whatever spiritual leaders, Krishnamurti, and Krishnamurti's statement, uh, which I love so much, is said, if you want to change what is the status quo, you really have to change your consciousness or your perception as to how you look at it. You know, women didn't get smarter in the 1920s. We allowed them to vote because we changed our perception. So similarly, when we start changing our perception where the subsidy should go, because this whole world is full of subsidy, the airline industry, the agricultural industry, we spend $750 billion on defense every year in the US, 10 billion on aid, half of it goes to consultants. So when we change our perception that we cannot tolerate that, with subsidies we can make sanitation profitable, there is, you know, there's enough public toilets and, and work in the sanitation, although it's in young stages. Affordable housing, microfinance, solar, these are the more mature markets where one can achieve returns. Part of the problem in community development in the U.S., I think, has been, and since I've worked in this sector, is perpetual need for subsidies. You know, they have sort of this, the community development sector in the U.S. is so hooked on subsidies that they can't do anything without it. Now, there's a room for subsidy, but there's a room for innovation and thinking outside the box. So, Bruce? Well, that was a lot. <laughs> um, and I do think, I, I'm gonna make a last point. I, th I think we should move on. We're gonna, we're gonna lose, uh, lose, this, lose the schedule here altogether. Um, but to me, it's very simple what, what, a, what a successful future looks like. A successful future is where this meeting is a mainstream investment meeting. That what we're doing here is the norm and not considering stakeholders, not considering impact would be considered very odd to do. The, the point about stakeholders that, uh, I'm sorry, I can't see your name tag, but you just brought up, that that becomes the norm. And specifically, the challenge when you run a business, and I think back to the businesses I've run, um, the challenge is that many business leaders, it's not that they don't care about these things. I mean, we're all human, we all care. The challenge is that when you face a trade-off, you're very stressed on how to make that decision. A trade-off between I can make a little more money today or support other stakeholders and maybe make more money in the long run. And that's something where we actually don't provide much guidance to our business community today. The guidance is, the norm is, shareholder value maximization today. That is the norm. And I think if that norm changed, so essentially the sort of work you're doing, that would be a really fantastic future. And actually, I think it might, simply because, again, I don't want to put too much emphasis on millennial generation. I see a few of you sitting around the audience, a few uh, former students of mine. Um, but in fact, because I have great faith that younger generations, actually, this is their norm. They're just trying to get us all to change direction. So let's, let's go on to the next stage. Thanks very much. Thank you.